there was curfew in those days in Bangkok. We were under martial law. Ah. And I said, oh, I got here last night. And she said, oh, good. Then you don't have a girlfriend yet. And then there was like around the Malaysia Hotel, and like you say, yeah, I'd have guessed that's that. That's my right? neighborhood. Yeah, that's that. What is your name again? Please? Ball, hop ball. We like football. The mother in law took all the boards, took the house apart and boards, put it on the boat, and went up along Sandsap to Banka B. Well, he was a black American cowboy yeah, with yeah. a big no, 10 no, gallon hat. He wasn't a hat. cowboy. No, no, he but, had I mean, a cowboy. He had the hat. Hat. Later on, when I was hanging around and, and coming and going, I met one of my friends, an Australian guy yeah. from Apocalypse Now. And like a motorbike tour. Example, if foreigners who live in Bangkok, yeah. they want to do tour around Thailand, but they have no bike, mm -hmm. they can come to me. This guy named, nicknamed Shrimp had this thing called Shrimp Calendars. Okay. Sansap was to put the house on a boat, and that's how they moved things in, 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 the, in the, the 70s or 60s, actually. Yeah. But uh, we also do like a package. We can do all documents, we can do prepare all the bike for you, that's it. And they had a shitload of dough from smuggling and whatever. So they came here. The longer I'm here, the more I realize, the less I know. Greetings, Internet. Good morning and welcome back to my channel. We're on the way right now. We're going to go and pick up my friend Russell, who arrived here in Thailand in October 1978. He's got enough stories to tell for the next two weeks. He's a bit of a character. I'm going to go and pick him up and take him to the local racetrack. And we're going to have a chat about the early days from 78 to, let's say, mid to late 80s. Let's jump straight in. Um, my name is Bo, yes, but I never watched football. <laughs> Let me take you back to the early days. You got here, what, in 1979, right? 77. 77, wasn't it, of course. Now... But it was it was October or whatever, so it's almost 78. First of all, I just want, if you can think back that far, mate. <laughs> <laughs> how? How was it? You know, you stepped off the plane, jumped in a taxi. What was, no. what, what was it like, man? So, in those days... Don Mung Airport didn't have, um, I think they're called skywalks or something. It's that that thing that goes out to the airplane. Yep. So the airplane landed in the in the in on the, the runway, and a little tractor with carriages, two carriages, pulled up to the stairway, walked down the stairs, and got on the uh, the little tractor, and we're we're driven across the runway to uh, the terminal yeah. and our baggage was loaded on a, a little farm cart that they pulled behind the tractor right and um, we got into Bangkok and there was no elevated expressway in those days there wasn't even really a, an expressway huh. it was just sort of a, a, a divided road and there was no signage there were no advertising signs in those days thailand had a law against advertising signs bigger than a certain size or something so there were no big billboards now all of the roads are just cluttered with billboards but there was one billboard and and they kept saying yeah yeah it's it's illegal but it's it, that's the future thailand's gonna you know the advertising guys are gonna get billboard law passed and they did and now we got billboards everywhere was there aircon in the car no no there wasn't no no, no. very few cars had aircon the taxis didn't have aircon the taxis it was very weird so at the airport um, there were no taxi taxis, there were only black plate cabs. And the black plate cabs were just regular people with regular cars who hung out at the airport picking up people and then charging whatever they would pay to go wherever they wanted. Because taxis didn't have meters. And so even if there was a taxi taxi, a little, a little car with a taxi sign on the roof, uh, they didn't, you had to negotiate the, the price with them. Right. So, Tourists paid more and locals paid less. And if you were a friend of the driver and he was taking you somewhere, it might be free, like that. Right. Where did you go and stay the first, the first time and why did you stay there? What made you choose it? I stayed at the Miami Hotel on Petbury Road because Ooh. it was close to the Peace Corps office where I was supposed to meet my friends the next morning. Ah. Yeah. That was at 
Do you remember kind of out there. Do you remember how much that was? No, 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 but it wasn't much. It would be 100 or 150 baht like that. It was 25 to 1 in those days. Yeah. So what did you do? Did you settle in Bangkok? Did you have a good look around of Bangkok? Or what, 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 tell me about the first few, so a few weeks. So, so the first morning I woke up and I walked a couple of blocks to... So no internet or anything like that. And I bought a... Nancy Chandler's walking map of Bangkok. I used walked to around love the corner. That. Yeah, yeah. Walked around the corner to the Peace Corps office, and uh, there was a note in the window. I'd gone to meet some friends, and they weren't there. And I met these guys with motorcycles. So I started talking to them. And um, one guy had a BMW, and the other guy had a Suzuki X6 Hustler. Mm. And when I was about 15, I wanted a Suzuki X6 Hustler so bad. That was the hot bike. Sure. So I got talking to these guys, and they were Peace Corps guys. And the guy with the BMW said, I'm a vegetarian, and uh, my girlfriend is going to make vegetarian spaghetti. And if you want to come have spaghetti, get on this bus and get off here. And we're there. So... Um, he had a girlfriend who had a boyfriend who was an Australian oil worker in Saudi Arabia. Right. He would go away for six weeks and come here for a couple of weeks and go away for six weeks. So he was a really funny guy, and he would leave the oil job in his work stuff, get on the airplane, buy a couple of bottles of duty-free booze, and arrive in Bangkok. And he had an apartment and a girlfriend, and her brother... He bought a car, and her brother drove a, uh, got a, a, a taxi-like car. It wasn't really a taxi. It was a black plate taxi. Right. So her brother drove a taxi and uh, would pick him up at the airport, and he would arrive in his dirty clothes and go back to his condo and take a shower and change, put on his Hawaiian shirt and his shorts, and he played golf and, and screwed around like that. So I arrive at the condo, and there's three or four girls, and the girlfriend says... How long have you been in Bangkok? And I said, oh, I got here last night. And she said, oh, good. Then you don't have a girlfriend yet. Oh. And I said, no. <laughs> and she said, the next thing I knew, she said, oh, I, I have a younger sister who's just here from my country. So the next thing I know, I'm sitting in this Papasan chair, and this cute little Thai girl is sitting in my lap feeding me spaghetti. <laughs> so I thought it wasn't such a bad place to hang out. We were, they had some dope. I had some dope. It was great so I ended up hanging around so I don't know I was in Bangkok maybe uh, like a week and they said come on down they were both out of Bong San yeah. the guy with the BMW taught diesel engineering at the Chonburi Technical Institute mm. and the guy with the Suzuki was a wildlife biologist and he lived with another wildlife biologist and an English teacher at the university who was a civilian, yeah. and another of their friends who lived in Bang San but in a different house was a medical technician. So the medical technician was showing, setting up a, a lab at the Chonburi Hospital, and the diesel engineer, diesel mechanic guy taught, taught uh, the Thai guys how to build and rebuild diesels and stuff. And the wild biologist and his friend, it was at um, Khao Kio National Park. But it wasn't called Khao Kio and it wasn't National Park. It was a national park, but it was uh, people couldn't go there. And they didn't have the road that, that cuts through like that. Mm. So when they were going to declare it a national park, he did a lot of studies. I spent, I don't know, months and in, in Bang San. And every week or two we'd go out to the mountain and, and hike around and we counted elephant poop and we can we looked for bear poop and, and we counted deer and one couple of times we caught frogs and a couple of times we went out one night I can remember going out catching bats and uh, you see any crazy animals or <clears throat> excuse me. I mean, did you see any elephants, for example, or, or any no, signs? No, no, we, we, I, I never, we, we saw some things like that, but nothing very weird or strange. The okay. strangest thing I ever saw was leaf cutter ants, and they were walking across the jungle on the, they were crossing the path that we were walking yeah. on, 
and there was so many of them, you, they went off to one side, and they were maybe six or eight feet wide. You had to literally back up and run two or three steps and jump over them like they were a, a, <laughs> little, a little river of ants. Millions of ants going and carrying a leaf in one direction and going back empty. It was nuts. Yeah. When I always think about Bang Sen, I think about the nightmarish weekends in terms of the amount of people to come down from uh, Bangkok because it is the number one Thai holiday spot these days but there's a lovely promenade right the way down now was it as busy then at the weekends and it was always busy on the weekends but not like today of course but right. there were always buses from Bangkok that came in with 20 or 30 people who'd all get up and it was the old the old days you you rented a, a beach chair and an umbrella and yeah. ordered food from the people walking up and down the beach and stuff like right. that but it was never very crowded and it was always really quiet and uh, I lived there for I don't know a year and a half maybe uh, and in what sort of property did you live? Well, okay, so I was going to say is in, in that time, um, the, the hotels were only open on the weekends. There was only two or mm. three hotels on the main road. There was no second soy, there was no roundabout, the, none of that was developed. The university was just a piece of out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, the main road had coconut trees that grew, grew on it like that. So. The English teacher, his name was Paul, he had a real good deal from Budapai University. And they gave him, I want to say, 3,000 baht a month to rent this house. And that was like crazy money in those days. And the house was owned by um, the family of the mayor of Bangsan Municipality. And it was kind of a big old place at the end of the road by Khao Samuk. And um, it, in, in those days, that much rent was like crazy money. And um, so they called him Achan because he was a, a real teacher. He had real teaching paper. Right. And um, he was not, for all intents and purposes, he was the head of the English department at the university. And um, so, in order to get some money on the side, my Peace Corps friends could rent rooms from him. And it was like, ah, I want to say he charged like maybe a hundred baht a month or something like that. It was like real cheap and, and he mostly wanted the company mm. and drinking friends and you know, somebody to like that. Um, but, but while I was there, I went to the vocational school a couple of times with my friend. I went up to the, the, the mountain, I don't know, 20, 30 times. Yeah. Yeah, a lot. Because it wasn't a national park. It was, it, it was you know, a thing on the road. And so he was, he, he was a Karachagon. He was detailed by Peace Corps as a wildlife biologist to the Department of Wildlife Resources or right, something. Right, okay, yeah. And he had a little tan outfit and, and yeah. a gold braid on his shoulder for official meetings and you got to remember that all, all in all the Peace Corps people could read and write and speak Thai and knew all the customs they go through a really they did they went through a really intensive uh, learning uh, and an immersion yeah. I wanted to ask you about that actually that um, at what stage in this early time or at this early stage, did you think to yourself, do you know what, I'm going to learn Thai? I never did. <laughs> no, but you do. You speak no, Thai, no, though, no. Russell. So, <clears throat> so, I got married. My wife and I went to America. We lived there for about a year and a half. She didn't like it so much, so we came back. So when I came back, I came back, and my cousin uh, had just sold his restaurant and was at Loose End, so he came too. So when we got back to Thailand and, and moved to the mother-in-law's house in Bangkapi, he found us a Thai, uh, an English language school where they would teach us Thai. Is that Mike? Yeah, my cousin right. Mike Bloomy. Okay, yeah, okay yeah, so, yeah, so Bloomy, Bloomy jumped right in and he was more gung-ho than I and <laughs> um, he, so, so we learned uh, our Gawkai Kaukai's for a while, yep. and at one point, I had a massive hemorrhoid attack, 
and nice. missed missed a couple of days of school. Okay. And that was the vowels and the endings. And um, so I never learned very much reading and writing Thai. I only know a little. A no, little, but, little but, bit. but I mean speaking, you I, you're fluent. Well, yeah. You, no, no, no. I'm not. No, I didn't no, say, no, no, no. I didn't no, say no. you were a native speaker. No, no, no. But not Are even you? fluent. Not yeah. even fluent. I can only talk to my workers. I can only go to the bathroom. I can order, order food. I can right, only okay. do some simple okay. things. I can read signage and license plates and stuff if I kind of know what it's about. I can pick out words and stuff. But no. And it's incredibly difficult. So Bloomy can read, um, but he doesn't know what all the words mean. Just because it says right. Ram, R-A-M, it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean... Like, you know how we know that there's, yeah. you know, white mountain uh, yes. come... Cow, 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 cow. Yeah, 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 right? Like that. And they're all spelled differently, right? So unless you know which spelling is... Okay, and okay, and okay. my... My, 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 yeah, would, yeah, yeah, yeah. know, and knew. Any chicken right? eggs here? Uh, you got it. Kai, 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 kai. And they're all spelled differently, <laughs> but if you read them, they mm. sound the same. So they if do. you don't know what the spelling is, you don't know what yeah. that word is. So the longer I'm here, the more I realize, the less I know. And a lot of things sound the same, but are different yes. because they're spelled differently. Right. Because we don't hear, I don't hear the rising and the falling okay. and the tonal inflection. We're very, very, very bad with that. Now, lucky for us, we're not Germans, we're not Russians, yeah. we're not uh, Cockneys like Derek, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm. We've jumped forward quite a long time there. Uh, you mm -hmm. want to go back? Yeah, because you said, oh, I went to America, came back. So, you've been married to your wife how long, mate? 40 something years. Wow. <laughs> One of you needs a medal. I'm not commenting. <laughs> But, um, me, me. <laughs> <laughs> How long had you been there before you met? I, I should say as well, not that it really matters, but you you grew up as a, as a Jewish guy, right? Jewish right. American, and your wife is Muslim. Yes. Russell is is it, it grew up as a as an American Jew, Jewish guy, and um, is surrounded like his his whole family are Muslim now. Yet yet they seem not to fight or argue about anything. So. Just a little aside, I, I digress, carry on. So how long were you there before you met your missus? I, so, I stayed with the little girl from the Papasan chair, and then uh, I went yeah, to Bang San. And then, that, and man. then in Bang San, yeah. we would either go to Padia or to go to Bangkok. And right. in those days, it was, you know, a couple of hours. It was a long bus ride yeah. or like that. So when I came here, I met the Peace Corps guys. Yes. Then later on, when I was hanging around and, and coming and going, I met one of my friends, an Australian guy yeah. from Apocalypse Now. And we had just, he, we, we didn't, we just bumped into each other. Okay. So he was hanging out with shrimp. This guy named, nicknamed Shrimp had this thing called Shrimp Calendars. He got popped later on. But anyhow, he had Thai girls, beautiful Thai girls, and he made these calendars and he sold them internationally. Right. And he was a photographer and he did advertising. He, he was legit. But so anyhow, so my friend Barry was hanging out with Shrimp. I met Barry and um, we were hanging out and I met my wife. <coughs> and it was... There was curfew in those days in Bangkok. We were under martial law. Ah. And uh, everything closed at midnight. So mm. if you were in a club or a bar or a coffee shop, uh, you had to stay there until, I don't remember if it was 4 or 6 a.m. It was ah. probably 4 a.m. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because Thais got up early in market and stuff. So it was probably 4 a.m. So midnight to 4, they couldn't be on the roads. And there were soldiers and police in the streets. So um, he and his girl... And me and my wife jammed into a tuk-tuk, the four of us. Round about 1980? Yeah. Round about then, yeah. yeah. About like that. I'll have to think about that some more. But, but anyhow, so the four of us jammed in the tuk-tuk, zoomed down to Shrimp Studio, which was down near Cougar Promote's house. And, oh, um, near Saturn. Saturn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, I know where that down is. Down near the old immigration yeah. office. In, 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 but yeah. anyhow, it was harder to get to because a lot of those roads, the new cut roads and stuff. Yes. Um, so I 
thought for some reason that we could stay there too, but we couldn't. So he and his girl got out of the tuk-tuk down near Saturn, and my wife said, let's go to my place, which was on Akamai. And in those days, it was pretty far away. So the tuk-tuk guy complained, and he zoomed over, and we had to give him a tip because he had to sleep in the tuk-tuk because uh, she lived on a small soy off of, off of Akamai. Uh, and uh, Akamai Road was one of the ones that was closed at night, and so once he got off the main road onto the little soy, he couldn't get back onto the main road. So we had to give him a tip so he could sleep in his tuk-tuk until 4 o'clock in the morning and, and then go wherever he was going to go. That was pretty funny. There's a lot of that stuff, staying in the bars all night because it was curfew. Yeah. We're here today at the Motorsport Park in Sawanabum. It's actually on Romclau Road and it's closer to Minbori or Klong Samwa. It's often used for various events, car events, and it's used on a weekly basis as well to train motorcycle riders. This place isn't just for speed, it's a very technical place to come and learn. I'm gonna come and film a video here for the for the beginners. <laughs> okay, so you are the, the owner or the, the, the manager of this place or oh actually actually I'm like a coach and coach people. Right. But and as the, the second job is I own the coffee shop. Fantastic. Yeah, I do the coffee shop, I coaching people, I also do like a motorbike tour. Example, if foreigners who live in Bangkok, yeah. they want to do tour around Thailand, but they have no bike, mm -hmm. they can come to me. Fantastic. And where, what sort of places do you do you take people on tours to? Uh, depend depend on depend on uh, how many your holiday. Example, someone have only two or three days, we go maybe Khao Yai okay. National Park. Yes. Only uh, 200 kilometers away from Bangkok. We stay one or two nights. But if you have more time, like a one week, we can take you to like a Chiang Mai, not of Thailand, Mae Hong Son, not Eastern, yes. wherever you want to go. And what about if you live here? Can we go internationally around like Myanmar or? Uh, yes, for Thai people, we, we can enter to Laos, okay. Myanmar, Vietnam, China, quite easy. But foreigner, you it, need to make visa. Indeed. But, but we also do like a package. We can do all document, we can do prepare all the buy for you, that's it. Um, and I'll put some details in f uh, for you below. So if somebody wants to come here and learn to ride a motorbike properly, Yeah. they can do that from you, right? Uh, I believe most will have skill, but they don't, they need someone to prove. I, d I don't want to say I can teach, maybe someone better than me, but I can prove and help them, Fantastic. correct them. That's good. Yeah. Depend if I th they want to learn. I think it's an important service with the traffic in Bangkok. It's very difficult, no? So yeah. I'll put all your details down below as well. And what, what is your name again? Please? Ball, Cup Ball. We like football. Ball. Ah, okay. Yeah. And which football team do you like? Yeah. Which which football team is your your favourite? Um, my name is Ball. Yes, but I never watch football. <laughs> Too into the motorbikes. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you very much indeed. You will. Cheers, man. And we'll just have a good look around. This is a great yeah. place. Enjoy Thanks. Your day. Thank you. He said for a basic course, it's a thousand baht, and you get to follow follow him around and that sort of thing. And then for another fifteen hundred baht, he'll teach you a little bit more uh, of how to control the bike, a bit more aggressive behaviour, how to ride in Bangkok, a bit of slal and that sort of thing. So he's got courses for every level. Just missed a decent crash there, a bit of a slide anyway. This is the main grandstand and you can rent this place out. You can come here on a track day or I believe you can rent it out for an hour or a morning or an afternoon. I'll put the phone number and all that sort of stuff in. Yeah, today's just a normal track day and they do lessons here as well. That's what's going on here, the slower guys, they're, they're on a, a riding lesson. Pretty good thing to have on the streets of Bangkok. Yeah. Early days of Bangkok, bear in mind, there was no mass transit system, right? There was no, there was no uh, MRT, no underground, no overground. No, there was no... only non-aircon buses. Tuk-tuks? Tuk-tuks. Motorcycle taxis? No, no motorcycle taxis. Were there taxis. any cycle 
like SAM laws, or was that just in small towns even by then? The the SAM laws were all two wheels in front. Right. Because in the Philippines, they're all sidecar yeah. for people to ride yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. But in Thailand, they were in front. Right. And there were still those bicycle ones That's what I mean, where you yeah. sit on the back and the yeah. guy pedals in front. Yeah. And there were the motorcycle ones where you sit in front, right. two people, uh, and, and he's got a motorcycle engine. And but um, those weren't mm. very common at all. It was almost right. all bicycles. Okay. Every uh, Ayutthaya, uh, all the tourist places mm. were all bicycle bicycles. And at that time, obviously, the you know, Khao San Road was, was a twinkle in someone's eye, right? It didn't was a, exist. It was a rice market. Um, I know there were different notorious areas you had near the train station with some really dodgy cheap places can't really see you staying there and then there was like around the Malaysia Hotel and like you say yeah I'd have guessed that's that. my neighborhood yeah that's 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 the hangout spot and then you got Miami Hotel Atlanta Hotel yeah what was for example what was the tallest building in Bangkok then do you remember the Chok Chai Steakhouse on Sukhumvit 26 20, 20 something so that was before Dusit was built no no the Dusit wasn't, wasn't that tall Dusit was only uh, 10 stories tall or something. Right. Chok Chai was 20, 26 or 20 something stories tall. The story okay. was that it was uh, built because the American government wanted a radio listening station in the basement, some kind of conspiracy like right. that, that, you know, there was a So do you reckon, control. by the time you got here, do you reckon there were still spooks about, as in the, like the CIA guys? Oh, they were here for about, years, you know, yeah. were, Oh yeah, and wh- and all the time. Where was the hangout spots? Was it Pat Pong? Was yeah, it, Pat, was Pong, it? Pat Pong. They all right. hung out at Pat Pong. There was no other spots. Right. There was no other neighborhoods. Okay. There was um, there was no Nana Plaza. Right. Um, before Nana Plaza, uh, and what happened was then then people had moved to Soy Cowboy, but but uh, a Cowboy had already moved off of Soy Cowboy to across the street by mm-hmm. then because mm-hmm. the rent had gone up. You know, they were they were all uh, watering holes. Did, right where regulars hung out. Did you mm. talk talking of that? You just mentioned it. Did you ever hear back then about the original guy called Cowboy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I met him once or twice. Right. Uh, he was a, um, I want to say a was cook it? in the Air Force, but it wasn't. He wasn't a cook in the Air Force, but he was. He came here with the American military in the sixties. It I was, heard he was a black American cowboy yeah, with a big no, ten no, gallon hat. No, he wasn't a cowboy. No, but I mean, he had the hat. He had, had the a hat. cowboy hat, and he was <laughs> from the Midwest somewhere, okay. and he had a real name. Brilliant. Um, but but he had already moved off of the soy cowboy. By the time it got the name soy cowboy, he was gone because okay. the rents went up. Yeah. Right. When he went out to that soy, he was the only bar there, and and like, like I said, in those days there weren't tourist. That there weren't a lot of tourist bars and stuff. It was a watering hole. There were, there were less tourists and more right. uh, expats. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. so when I first got here, there were more Mormon missionaries oh. than there were people in the American embassy and wow. military, you know, um, liaison, many, uh, yeah. foreign service. Uh, a friend of mine's wife worked for, it's called, it was called USI. I-S? U.S.? U.S. I.S. I.A.? Anyhow, it had to do with libraries. It, so they were in charge of AUA, the American University yeah, yeah. Abroad, yeah, yeah. right? That's part of the American government. And and so her division of the government, whatever, U.S.I.S. or U.S.I.A., uh, that so, was just one of the things that they did, you know. Just but, to be clear, those Mormons that we refer to, they're the ones we occasionally still see cycling around with a white shirt and black trousers. Yes. Uh, Church of the Latter-day Saints. Got to have a white shirt, necktie, black trousers, leather belt, leather shoes. I believe and Church of the Latter-day Saints. Yes, Church of the Latter-day Saints, Mormons from America. Right. And and I believe when you're 20, you have to do two years as a missionary abroad. Mm, mm. And they all go abroad, and they learn the language, and they learn to sing. And okay. uh, they, they, they mostly send them up country to prostitute. Okay. Pros- to the ties, okay. and they all got the book, and lots of times. So there must be a house or home for them somewhere near Asok and Sukhumvit because I see them going up and down there a lot. That's what I see. And when Sukhumvit, I first yeah. lived out in Bangkapi, um, there was a I forget what they call their temple, but there was a, a, a Mormon church that was in a home in a muban, and. The yeah. they're called elders. Yes. The elders, the okay, missionaries, yeah. Yeah, are yeah, twenty yeah. years old. and They're called Mor- Mormon elders, and the elders, I think they're called elders. They probably are. Yeah, so yeah. And anyhow, so so uh, 
I don't know, there was six or eight of them who lived in this move on down the road from my house, but uh, they never, they all went somewhere. They didn't associate with us foreigners. So they, they were more interested in, in teaching Thais to be uh, Mormons. Mormons, yeah. So, yeah. so when you say the early days, so you've, mm. you've moved back to Bangkok. Now, where, what was the first, okay. what, where's, hang on, where's the first area? That sounded very rude. I know Russell really well. Um, where was the first area that you lived in, in Bangkok, mate? So, when I came back from America with my wife, we moved into my mother-in-law's house, as every, every good son-in-law does, and then remodeled the mother-in-law's sure. house a little bit. Um, she lived in Bangkapi, in Bungkum, and okay. in those, it was on what's now Seri Thai Road. Yep. And in those days, they had Sukapiban 1, 2, and 3, which was yep. Nawa Min, Siritai, and Ram Kamhang. But Ram Kamhang ended at Talat Bankabi. And then okay. it was called Sukapiban 3. Was it? Yeah. Okay. That, that, went, that went up that long way. Long before the National Stadium or anything, that oh, is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, long before. Uh, so, so the little red truck that goes to Hugh's house from yeah. the market, yeah. the other route went to Muban Samakon. Ah. Bloomy lived in Samakon. Bloomy had two different houses in Samakon right. at one point. Um, Massive move on though, isn't it? Oh, it's yeah. huge. I, I did some work in there and I remember that they said there's 4,000 property sites, there's 3,800 homes, yep. and there's 700 foreigners that live in the village. Okay. That includes Japanese, Chinese, Doesn't Koreans. I mean, you know, me. yeah, yeah. So, what, what so that, that village, you know, that's got a gas station, a hospital, a uh, wet food market, two 7 Elevens. Villa. Uh, yeah, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Bunch of French restaurants. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. got villa, it's got restaurants, it's got English yeah, restaurants. Yeah, it's like it. Everything. It, Lakes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, what sort of property did you live in? Was it a condo or a house? It was a house. So, in, in Thailand, they have these things, these, these areas, and I think they're called Chum Chon, but I could be wrong. And it's land that belongs to either the Wat or the mosque, yep. and people get a lifetime rental agreement for a plot of land, and then they build their own houses. Uh -huh. so. yeah. My wife was born on Klong San Sap at uh, Soy, which chameleon hospital, 47, 49? 49. 47, 49, 49, I think, 49. 49. Okay, so she was born, because there was no chameleon hospital. So she was born in a little house on the Klong on Soy 49. Oh. Then they moved the house to Tongla, then they, that grandma. So so it's a wooden tie house. They took it all apart. Grandma saved all the nails, put it on a boat, moved it from Tongla to Ekamai, and then uh, from, from uh, Soy Klong, 49, to Tongla, Tongla to Ekamai, and then Ekamai to Bangkapi. As the mosque got bigger, yeah and expanded, mm -hmm. and they got uh, either a new imam or the son of an imam, and then they're gonna have a new, a new branch of the mosque, so mm -hmm. uh, the people could move. So the mother-in-law took all the boards, took the house apart and boards, put it on wow. the boat, and went up along Sansap to Banka B. So those, I mean, there's so many mosques, we've discussed yes, this yeah. before, but there's um, always, um, when, when people are moved, or they have to move, or they choose to move, um, usually the Muslim community stay within Within quite close proximity to Sansap, right? Well, no, it's wherever they go. But but so so mm. the reason they went up Sansap was to put the house on a boat, and that's oh. how they moved things in 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 the in the, the seventies or sixties actually. Yeah, and so. Um, so the mosque was built, and it had a piece of land, and then they divided the parcels, and people were allowed to rent them. Right. So the the parcel that my mother-in-law rented was thirty-six. Talangwa, and she paid 36 baht a year rent to the mosque. And she could have had a 50 Talangwa yeah. piece of land, but she was afraid that 50 baht a year was too much money, <laughs> and that she, yeah. could, she would be able to afford 36. Yeah. Three baht a month instead of four was, was, was within her budget. So um, I lived there for, I don't know, 10 or 12 years, and then... Okay. Uh, we moved farther out to, to yeah. We go back, let's say, um, you know, late 70s, early 80s, before you went to America mm. with your wife, mm. uh, let me ask you about a couple of things. Let me ask you about, um, just tell me about the young Russell. What sort of stuff did you do? Did, uh, 
So so when, when I was hanging out? out when I was hanging Are out with my peace. Yeah, beer all all okay. the time, a lot of beer. Okay. Um, when I was hanging out with the Peace Corps guys, uh, and there were English teachers and stuff, um, one of the guys in Bangkok um, needed a substitute, and so they said, Russell, you can teach English, it's real easy. Look, this is a conversation course for the teachers. Right. No problem. I said, okay, so it was like 100 baht, and I didn't have anything better to do. Yeah. So I put on a nice shirt, and they said, um, I'm trying to think of where I was staying. Anyhow, so they said, just get to the bus station at Ekamai, and next door to the bus station at Ekamai is the weather station, and at the weather station, the school bus picks up people at Ekamai and takes them to the school. Yeah. So I think, okay, that's cool. So the school bus is one of the little open green death things, and about a half a dozen people in white shirts are all sitting around. So we get on the bus, and the bus goes, up and goes down Sukhavit, it goes down Sukhavit, goes down Sukhavit, and then it turns left on on Nut, and it goes and it goes, and on Nut, peters out into nothing. Longest nothing, road in nothing. the universe. On it that. must be anyhow. It was it was a dual carriageway, single track asphalt road through the jungle, and we rode for about a half an hour, and then we came to where Srinakarin Road is, is now, yeah. and there was the Bua restaurant with a pond, mm. and then we kept going, we kept going, kept going, and anyway, we ended up at King Mankut Institute of Technology, uh, Lot for Bomb. I know that. But yeah. it, it was like an hour and a half <laughs> on the bus yeah. to the university, and I'm thinking, where are we going? Yeah. Where are we going? And this is, I'm thinking, we're going halfway back to Bang San. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I went there a couple of times. They didn't like me as a substitute teacher because I didn't have a teacher's paper. Right. So the time that they learned didn't count. And yeah. I didn't know how to be a teacher and they wanted pronunciation. So like a, a fool, I, bought a, I brought a book of poetry and a novel right. and asked them to read out loud. And that embarrassed them, right. and poetry doesn't translate, and they don't understand the rhymes. Right? I mean, you know, right? We, it's different. It's just you, different. So, you, anyhow, yeah. as an English teacher, I'm a total failure. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's obviously not your call. Now, I get that's so. In, yeah. So in the early years, let's say 80s. How how how? What did you do for a living? There? Because I know you so, all so sorts of stuff. So when when I was here. And I met my wife, and like that, I just hung out and fooled around and hung out at the beach and went with my friends and did stuff like that. I had money left from Apocalypse Now. Okay. And I was living incredibly cheaply. Bit of a hippie. Oh, yeah. I had a pierced ear with a little star, you know, and the whole thing. I can imagine um, you sitting around campfires smoking yeah, pot. And, yeah, and I like yeah. Thailand because you get all the dope you wanted. Absolutely. And, yeah, yeah. and yeah. Um, you know, so my wife lived in uh, a Thai apartment, yeah. a little one-room thing, and uh, it was cheap. I want to say maybe... Oh, maybe 150 baht a month, something like that. I mean, ridiculously cheap for, for what we expected. Right. But expensive, not expensive, but, you know, for her not to have a roommate, it was a luxury, yeah, yeah. right, you know. Um, so I hung out at the apartment building. Uh, she had her, her, her neighbors and her friends who they used to cook with um, was a Tom and a D. Uh, 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 Explain that. Okay, a lesbian couple. But the uh, Tom the, is the, the one that the looks Tom like is a the man. boy, yeah. and and the D means yeah. good, and that's the one who acts like a girl, looks like a girl. Right, okay, yes, and they yes, were good yes. fun. I'll think of their name in a little while. And we used to go places with them, shopping and stuff. And um, yeah, so I hung out. Then we went to America, and then when I came back and we moved out to uh, Bunkaby. I was hanging out with Bloomy, played a lot of golf, fooled around for about a half a year, and then we decided to get serious. So my son-in-law at the time uh, was a contractor, and I ended up doing stuff like that because I was always a fix-it guy at home. Right. And, yeah. and Bloomy ended up opening the White Rabbit restaurant for the Woodstock Bar ah. in Nana Plaza 
in about, I want to say maybe 1985 or 86. Well, that's big, because I'll tell you what, Woodstock, for about, I remember back in the day when I first got here, it, won, it used to win the best burger every year for years and years, and the reason people used to go, there was right in the middle of Nana Plaza, but it wasn't a girly bar at all. They just had, by the time I went there, they played just rock music, only vinyl still, and there were two pool, one or two pool tables in the Woodstock. It was an incredible place. So it was, it they was, had one pool table for sure. It was, might... it was Bloomy's idea, it was your no. cousin, no? No, no, no. So it's a guy named Kevin and a guy named Peter, right. and they had been relief workers in Afghanistan war. And they had a shitload of dough from smuggling and whatever. So they came here and they opened up the Woodstock Bar because Kevin had this huge collection of records. Okay, so Kevin was the DJ, and then they then they and then they had a DJ and like that. So they had girls. They had girls. I know it's our DJ there in later years, still yeah. vinyl, still records. Well, anyhow, yeah, yeah, no, it was a great place. So at one point they were doing really good, and they wanted American food. So. Um, it was hard, you know, there weren't, uh, all of this pizza, spaghetti, steak, all that stuff is all new. It's all, you know, within 20 years. The Thais, it used to be only Thai food. Yeah. So they thought that if they had a restaurant, uh, that it would be really cool. So they rented a place downstairs on the first floor in Anna and opened up the White Rabbit restaurant. And uh, Bloomy did the menu, did the buying, did, did set it all up. And then, I forget why, but they had a fight with, oh, I remember why the fights over money um, and uh, he, he he quit and then they moved it down the road they got an English guy named Kim who became the cook and they moved White Rabbit down one block down Nana not in the plaza but uh, down a ways but so what happened was Bloomy had set up the restaurant and in Thailand the way it works is the girl comes to your table and she writes a little paper and then she takes the paper back to the cashier yeah. and they make a thing and you have a little cup with the bills and then you go like that so Blimmy said okay so the girl takes the order you take the paper and you go to the cook and you tell the cook what the order is and then you go to the cashier and you make the paper and then you go back to the table and you put their paper right. in the cup and the wife who was gonna run the restaurant, who knows everything because she's a dragon, but she's not even 30, you know, but, but anyhow, she says, no, 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 the way it works is the girl comes to me and I write the paper. And then she goes to the, she puts it at the table and then she gives the order to the chef or something like that. And he says, no, you want the cook cooking the food immediately. You want the food order in first. You're not that concerned. She says, no, I count the money. I'm in, I keep the book. I'm, you know, so anyhow, they, that was that, so, and, and, and I, I forget why, but the rent was too expensive and you, some stuff like that. You could park, I hear you could park in Nana Plaza. You used to be able to park in Nana Plaza before they built those couple of bars that are on the ground level in there. There was also one that went in later that was a swimming tank, a big glass tank where the girls swam around inside. Um, all of that stuff is a, is a, a gangster give me. change those wheels but that is a dream car mate that mate change the back exhaust change the wheels different no, color that rear one doesn't open absolute but beauty the front wing one 